Well, welcome all to Silicon Valley uh, Ethereum Meetup. Uh, uh, my name is Jeff Flowers. Uh, we have uh, another uh, organizer, Chris Peel, uh, here. And uh, we're welcoming uh, Terrence from Prismatic Labs to introduce uh, Ethereum 2. This is a informal, uh, uh, oh, they, hi, there's uh, Steve as well. So this is going to be an informal fireside chat where we discuss Ethereum 2. It's uh, a, a huge uh, leap forward in, in, in the space, as we all know, and, and as we will begin to uh, see and know. Uh, so my thinking is, we'll get, we'll, uh, I'll allow, you know, give Terrence an opportunity to, you know, introduce himself, the project, what he's working on, but, you know, you know, we could talk about uh, questions after the fact. Uh, I've got a couple questions I've written down, but I'm sure there's a lot of questions from here in the audience. So I think operationally uh, for, for Zoom, if, if everyone could hit the participants, you know, button in the bar, uh, and it, maybe it'd be easier to hit the raise hand if you had a question, mm -hmm. and I'll just announce, say, oh, we have a question from, and, and that way we can uh, keep it a little bit more uh, uh, organized. So. If you can't find the raise hand, um, it, just go to uh, uh, participants, and then on the, the on the right hand side, it'll show all the participants, and you should see uh, mute me and raise hand. Uh, so welcome all, uh, and and of course this is being sponsored by the Decentralization Foundation, uh, d24n.org. Uh, wish we could offer digital pizza, but it doesn't quite have the same taste. <laughs> so, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll allow. Uh, uh, so let's start. So Terrence, welcome and thank you so much for coming uh, back. I want to share something. Uh, I, I really mean what I what I wrote. Uh, uh, this is an incredible uh, community. What Prismatic Labs has been able to accomplish beyond the, the incredible code that they've been able to uh, develop and, and roll out and push out. Uh, and I think that says a lot. I think, you know, having great code is, is, is one thing. Being able to foster a very uh, uh, nurturing and um, uh, community is another. And a lot of projects might have great code, but they have very not such great communities. And uh, quite recently, uh, the new uh, testnet, the Onyx testnet, which I'm sure Terrence will unpack more, was rolling out and I and I caught the tweet late and then I forgot about it and then I was like oh I gotta do it today <laughs> and I was doing something really quite dumb and I went on the discord channel and I explained what I was doing and of course I could have read the, the manual but you know nobody does that right and they were so gracious and say oh they really helped me at one point uh, Preston I think was like wait there's no data in the, <laughs> the transaction <laughs> And that's when I realized, oh, I'm an idiot. I've literally just been trying to send 32 test beats. And, and I thought to myself, I was doing this remote. I, I did it on the, the very first test net, and, and, and I was just spacing out. Uh, but I love that. Like, there's many people have done that. And that's like part of my biggest concern as I, as I went in towards mainnet is that why people actually do that with real money, right? So that's something that, like, myself us and community has to deeply think of like how do we prevent people that do that like how do we properly like educate people that do that right like my mom is not wants to stay 30 to eat but she's not likely gonna read the menu right she doesn't read the menu even for our oven for our just for our like just for our like electronic so how do we pre prevent that right so that's that's one of the biggest questions that we have to answer going forward Exactly. So, so Terrence, I'm going to let you take it away and uh, thank you again for coming oh, yeah. back. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Happy to be here. And I'm pretty sure I met most of you guys already. And I have given two talks at Hacker Dojo, if I remember correctly. So for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Terrence. I'm from Prismatic Labs and um, we have been working on um, the implementation of Ethereum 2.0 in 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 Go for um, since since the beginning, 
since early um, 2018. We have multiple iterations of testnet so far. And our late, latest testnet is called uh, Onyx. Not sure if you guys have a chance to participate. If you guys haven't had a chance to participate, please do try it out. And um, long story short, we're pushing for Ethereum 2.0 from the concept to a, to a, to a um, reality. And um, with that said, I don't really have any slides prepared today. I have multiple old slides that I've used in previous presentations. I have a bunch, um, bunch of articles. I have uh, my terminal. So I'm not sure how you guys want to go for it. Like, feel free to ask me anything. Happy to explain anything. So yeah, feel free to take you over. Yeah, so if, there, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I've got some really great questions. I might actually call since everyone's here and I, I wrote them down. Um, and, and so the first question I'm looking at is, uh, and I'll let Eric uh, McCarthy say it, but um, it, it's around the question on how do you know, smart contracts move from EVM to EWASM? Yeah, um, that's a hard one. So self-disclaimer, I spend most of my time thinking, researching, implementing phase zero, and that it's the beacon chain. So does everyone in this chat have a decent understanding of what the beacon chain is? If you don't, feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to go through this in more depth. I think it's important that we build this foundation before we move forward with more questions. Okay, so, okay, so I see a few hands raised. So I'm just gonna share my I'm gonna open a few slides actually. It might be easier to explain with a few slides. Okay, cool. So, um, okay, so what is Beacon Chain? So let's use the next few minutes to talk about what a Beacon Chain is, right? So on the top, you have this E1 chain, which we love and we use today where all the DeFi actually is happening. So what we're doing, what, what my team is doing is that we're building this Beacon Chain that is below, is this green thing right there. So um, it's a proof of stake chain. And all it does is essentially it hosts validator activities. So um, in each one, you have miners. And as we're transitioning towards proof of stake, you have validators. So this is where a validator plays. This is validator's playground, right? There's no user level activity. So um, you can deposit 32 ETH. That's the amount today to become a validator. And what you're doing in this chain, which your playground is that you're essentially voting on, you're voting on the truth, right? The truth here means what is the right ETH1 chain and what is the right shard chain. So the whole phase zero is essentially building out this big chain, chain, right? And this is so important because this is the fundamental of proof of state protocol. This is the fundamental of what the E2 is. So without this beacon chain, nothing will happen, right? There, there wouldn't be any um, user data, there wouldn't be any execution, right? So this is where the magic happens. So um, I can probably go to one more slide. So this is basically, um, like this I said, E2 consists of E1 chain, which is what we have today, and then the beacon chain, which is what we're building. It's proof of state, it manages validators, it provides finality, it has this random number generators, and it does a lot more things. And then you have your shard chain, which is phase one, phase two, which we're getting to more later in this talk. And uh, so what we're building now is beacon chain. So let's assume there's no more question. If you have any question, feel free to ask them right now. If not, I'm going to answer, I'm going to try to um, answer the question. So essentially what I want to get to is that I spend 99% of my time working on the beacon chain. I don't really spend too much time thinking about like, about like the execution type of stuff, such as smart contract, it wasn't. So I do read them regularly like, like any other people. So I will give you my best um, input, but if anyone has anything to say, feel free to correct me and stuff. So, um, so, so what's going to happen with the e e EVM contract? Okay, so, um, so we can change phase zero, and then as we move forward, there's phase one and there's phase two. So phase one is essentially um, sharding of data, right? So once you have the beacon chain and 
the next thing we want to do is sharding. So how do we um, shard the data? And currently in the ETH1 chain, um, every node has to validate every data, right? So your blockchain is essentially, so the, the limitation of your blockchain, it, it's, it, it's just that one node, how it process data. So what sharding does essentially, you essentially you can shard uh, the data. So now, so now every node um, has to verify all the data, right? So now you have this subset of nodes that verify data and that's how you get parallel speed. So that's what phase one is, right? And uh, so now you have shorted data, right? So now you have 64 ETH1 chain that's moving in parallel. That's what you can think of, right? So the current plan is to essentially move the ETH1 chain into one of the shard, okay? And there's many research that's going on. This is heavily under research right now. Why don't we um, move ETH1 chain and copy that into 64 shards? So now you have 64 ETH1 eat one chain that's going in parallel and the users can do different things. So now you get 64 times throughput versus the current eat one chain, right? So um, so what happens to the EVM contract, right? And so the EVM contract from the point of view is that you would just be copied over, right? So so there's phase zero, there's phase one, and now there's this phase 1.5 when we copy the ETH1 um, chain over. And the uh, it could be phase 1.5, it, it could happen in phase one. So don't worry too much about actually the phase number. So once it copies over from the user's level point of view, it just doesn't happen like seamlessly. Like you wouldn't even notice, right? You would just notice that your DAP is faster and uh, your gas price is probably cheaper. And uh, so from user's point of view that you don't have to worry about that. But here's a few, um, Here's a, here's a few nice things, right? Um, as a dev developers, you have this option because now you have a tons of data, right? So you don't really have to build your dev uses EVM on the shard chain. You can versus use you can use you can use, you can use like a layer two construction. You can you can use a row up chain on top of the phase one data chain. Just now data is free, right? Just how row up works is essentially you, you post data on the chain and then you execute it out off the chain. So now with this tons of data, you don't really need EVM. You can have your own construction. That's one nice thing. Another thing that you can do is that you can use Watson as well, right? So someone could build the similar EVM by using the Watson language and to see how that goes, right? So you do have that flexibility to explore, but initially to make things work, to to keep the momentum going, to not break any composability, we have to support EVM. And majority of the activity will happen on the EVM initially, right? So long story short, um, when that day happens, when we move EVM into the sharks, um, from the user's point of view, there's nothing to worry about. And if you're a node operator, for example, you run Infura nodes today to support dApps, you run ETH1 node, you just have to point your node to one of the shards. So it's just a few command line changes, I hope. And uh, yeah, that's You know, uh, again, so for everyone joining us, if you just raise your hand if you have any questions. Otherwise, I can go through some questions uh, that were raised earlier. Uh, but I have a question that just from what was just said. Mm -hmm. So is there any uh, talk or move? It sounded like you know the idea was to create EVM, but like basically to virtualize EVM in Ewasm. Uh, would that be so useful at all? Or it, it's not. It's essentially create the Ewasm VM, create a Ewasm VM that does the same thing as the EVM. So essentially, so it all comes down to the binary code, right? So EVM compiles to a binary. You can use the Watson to compile. You can use Rust, Go, Python to write to, to write the Watson code to compile to the same binary. And the trade-off is that some language may have um, less binary size. Some language may have heavier binary size. Rust is good with this. C++ is good with this. So you essentially you just need to compile to the same binary and then you can run it. But with that said, right, there is also the concept of like execution environment. So with phase two, sorry, I'm answering more questions than I should. No, no, no. Uh, for phase two, like there's this concept of, 
of um, as, as execution environment. So you don't have to bond it with the EVM scope, right? So what EVM does that is EVM only accepts certain transaction type, right? So everything is hard coded. But with the virtual, yeah. right, with the execution yeah. environment, you can define your own UTXO uh, Bitcoin model on the Ethereum chain. You can we can run a zk um, snark e setup VM there as well. So you can you have the flexibility to explore, right? So no one knows EVM is the best or not. No one knows EVM is the best or not unless we explore it further. You know, this was a question that came up. I don't know who asked it, unfortunately, but uh, if a shard in the future dies, you know, nobody's there to maintain that shard, you know, can knowledge be lost? You know, how, you know, how exactly are the, ma the maintenance and how are these maintained? That's a really good question. That's, so sharding, proof of stake started research at 2014, right? So you may ask like, why are we doing this so late? Like, why are we, like, it has been five years. And a lot of the questions is around that question, like what happens if data loss, right? It's especially in the context of sharding. <laughs> Since not every node verify every data, like you're, you don't wanna sacrifice the security because of that, right? <laughs> so um, there's two answers to that, right? The first answer is solving the um, data about data availability problem, right? So what happens if the data is lost in the blockchain? The second thing is, um, the second solution is called um, e, e, sorry, erasure coding, that's the second one. So uh, data, availability, data availability just means that we have to design a protocol that we can verify that every node verifies every data right so there's no lazy validator for example um for example I'll give you an example for example um jeff and i are both validators at shell one right and um bob basically um bob um bob posts a transaction and then me jeff and i have to verify um this transaction and uh, there's nothing prevent me to, to not verify the thing myself, right? I can just copy Jeff, we can, I can just copy Jeff's vote. I can just basically monitor Jeff's action. Jeff votes this and I would just follow the vote, right? So there's this lazy validator dilemma that we have to solve. So um, this is where data availability comes in, right? So there's this protocol, it's called um, custody. It's, um, I don't really, I don't, I haven't really like dig into it too much, but long story short is that a node has to download its data and uh, that's, but what happens if you don't, right? So from the protocol's point of view, um, protocol will basically, I'm not sure how, how, many, how many, how much, how many of you guys are familiar with TrueBit. So this is a similar concept. You basically, protocol will generate bad data by like 1% of the time it's bad data, right? So if you're a lazy validator, you don't verify any data, you just copy everyone's data, eventually you will get that bad data. And then someone can essentially uh, call you out, be like, hey, Terrence, you did not do your shit because of there's a bad data there. And then it's pretty obvious at that point, right? So with that, you will lose money. So that's kind of the game theory behind it. We have to ensure every node download every data. So that solves the data available data uh, data uh, avail uh, availability problem. The second thing is erasure coding. So this is not really blockchain thing. This is just typical like enterprise data server thing, right? So erasure coding means that um, you essentially, you only have to download, for example, um, I, I'm just using a random percentage. You only have to, you download 50% of the data, but you ensure that more than 200% of data is um, a, is um, available. So it's kind of like a RAID system, if you know like hard drive and SSD, right? So that, that basically ensures like, with some mathematical proof that you can ensure that uh, none of the data will be lost. Thank you. I think Herb had a question. Yeah, so some of our questions might be very basic. So let me apologize uh, yeah. beforehand if it's uh, too uh, basic for some of you guys. Hey, so I was reading up at Ewas, and this is the first time I've really, I mean, I've heard it before, but I'm looking it up right now. Um, and it says near native, near native execution speed for smart contracts. Um, 
so is it like a magnitude faster than what's currently available right now or is it is there a lot of performance issue with uh, the execution speed of smart current smart contracts in ether uh, 1.0 i actually don't know like this is like outside of my scope outside my work oh, okay and uh, okay. i would think if it's like that fast it's ready i would think more people will be using it so i'm not so sure yeah there's a reason like not everyone uses this there's there's, there's a reason of like it's not ready today and I'm not entirely sure what the problem is, but yeah. Okay. No, it's just, I'm looking at this website. Maybe it's not the, a good source of information, but basically it says it's the alternative for EVM. And yeah. it talks about some of the benefits of it and some of the, you know, it's like the ability to program in many uh, traditional languages, et cetera. And yeah. things like that. I guess one of the things I was curious about I also that's is that. nice, right? You can eventually yeah. program Python, like JavaScript, and then compile yeah. it to Boston code and then run smart contract versus like Solidity. Because not everyone likes Solidity, you know? Yeah. But I'm assuming from a sort of a compatibility issue, um, you know, I assume people that uh, have the existing contracts that are, written in Solidity, they don't have to be rewritten to work with you. Okay, so it's fully compatible in that sense. Yeah. Okay, just curious. All right, that, that's it. For now. Thank you. I think uh, Eric uh, had a question. Uh, yeah, um, I was asking, I, I was wondering if smart contracts will be migrated automatically from ETH1 or ETH to ETH2, or does someone need to create a copy of, of everything on ETH2 and then destroy the old contract if they don't want it to be used. And um, so. You will be sort of like a menu migration. So there will be a set of protocol defined, for example. So essentially what's gonna happen is the EF will essentially uh, define this protocol. It, um, Ethereum Foundation will define this protocol saying that uh, at Ethereum 1, at this block height that everything, we're gonna copy the state root of that block height and then move it over to a shard. So it has to be a manual process. And that's something that the community will decide on. That's something that everyone will decide on. So no one will be able to cheat. And, but yeah, long story short, short that it will be a manual process. If there's no one who can actually at, um do that for a particular contract, but there are users, will it just continue to work on the ETH1 yeah. chain? Yeah. Yeah, it will just work. So do you expect that there will be um, ETH1 and ETH2 monetary units with some exchange rate in the longer term future? Mm, that's, that is a deep question. So let me rephrase it if I understand correctly. So you're saying there's a ether. So there's so so there's one form of ether in ETH1, and there's another form of ether in the Bitcoin chain. And since in the beginning, those ethers are not interchangeable. So you're asking um, what happened with these two currency? Is is that a question? Yeah, it seems like maybe if there are these currencies, but you know, they're not directly right. changeable, but there's going to be a secondary market that arises, right? Right. So that's a good question. That's, we, we get that asked a lot. So, um, okay. So let me, let me address that. So for phase zero, um, one of the biggest concerns today is that there's no fungibility. Okay. So how it works that you deposit 32 ETH into a smart contract in, in the ETH1 chain, and then you become a validator in the ETH2 chain. And then now your balance exists in the ETH2 chain, right? So that balance in the ETH2 chain right now is a, we, you cannot withdraw it and you cannot transfer it, okay? So that's probably the biggest, biggest concern, the biggest question um, we get that today. And this is a tough one, right? So, 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 so right now there's, um, um, there's two options to make this work, okay? So let me give you the two. So let me give you the first option. So initially there was a transfer option between the validator and where, where the, um, so there was a transfer option, but we didn't wanna enable the transfer option in day zero. So the transfer option enables valid, validator um, liquidity. So that means that uh, Coinbase could be a validator, okay? So you can, if you don't wanna, validate anymore you need the cash to buy to buy a house whatever you can send coinbase the 32 eth and coinbase 
can take your card and then give you the 32 ETH and maybe less back, okay? So we didn't want to do that in the beginning just because if things go wrong, it's a lot harder to patch a network that has liquidity versus a patch a network that doesn't have liquidity. So that's one of our concerns. So we kind of want to let the, let the network go on for a while without liquidity, just in case things go wrong. So that's so that's one thing. And uh, the transfer option may or may not be enabled in the later phase. There's no timeline yet. And this is something that us uh, 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 as a community that um, you guys you need need to perhaps speak up if you just want the option, just because like. Um, I don't have much of a voice, neither does my team have much of a voice, because we're, we're not going to run that many validators. And at the end of the day, we are developers. So this is where like people that stay 32 ETH will, will have to speak up. So if people want this, this option to transfer fund between validators, if people think it's super helpful, then we can definitely enable that. So that's one option. The second option is that you can create this fungibility between ETH1 and ETH2, right? So the first option I said is just fungibility between ETH2 validator and validator. The other option is that you can create this fungibility between ETH1 and ETH2. So this is what we call the bi-direction transfer. So the work required for that is that we need an ETH2-like client on the ETH1 chain, right? So, so, uh, so we need the ETH2 cryptography pre-compiled in the ETH1 EVM. And the next hard fork for Dean on the on the ETH one is paving the way for that. So timeline, so timeline wise, it's probably gonna be a year for that to happen until until you have that kind of like fungibility by direction transfer between ETH one to ETH two, and then probably a year and a half for phase one point five, which is you have a shard in the inside the inside. Uh, inside, sorry, sorry, you have the ETH1 chain inside a shard. So by then you can transfer no problem. So that's the worst, so that's the worst thing. It's just, you have to wait until that. So that's probably like a year and a half, right? So my personal point of view, like this is just my personal point of view, doesn't stand for Prismatic Lab. It's just like, phase zero is kind of shaping up to be more like a risk taker type of thing. It's for like long-time believers, like but it's like for the holders. It's like if you're going to hold ETH for the next two years and you don't mind locking your ETH off for a year or two, and but then like but but then like in contrast, right, due to that risk, right, because there are less people participating, you are going to get a higher you're going to get a higher return, right? So right now, if you have one million dollar ETH and stake you get probably like 20% ETH, ETH and return. So which is quite nice, right? Which is like what I have been doing for the last two years. My ETH is just sitting there doing nothing, right? But you, now you can get a return back, right? So that's the trade-off. That's that's the options. And um, a lot of things are still undetermined right now. We're just pushing the ETH zero. We're just pushing the phase zero out. And then once that is out, not once that is out, sorry, maybe like two, three months before the mainnet launch, a lot more discussion will happen around like how do we get more to be more fungible? How why people want to cash out? How do we deal with the problem? There's two currencies. Just the another problem is just like tax space, right? It's like once you enable the fungibility between validators, there's this regulation in terms of tax, right? Like how do we like how do we how how, how do people deal with tax? That's something that people don't really have good insights with today. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we had a question from, uh, I'll mispronounce the name, I'm so sorry. Uh, John? John. Oh, if you could, John. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if you could lower your hands also, everybody, so I could know if there's a new question from you. I lower <laughs> my hand. I, I touch it. Uh, don't don't worry about you. You're, you're active. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, um, yes, um, I have some, I have a couple of sim simple questions. Simple sure. because, see, I, I, I I go around wearing my son t-shirts. <laughs> my neighbors think that I know what I don't know. No, you did. So I I have a, a, a node in the beacon chain, a validator <laughs> node that in two days should be validated, hopefully. Awesome. Look at you. So, Good job. <laughs> my question is, 
two questions. One is, uh, is there a site where um, I get instructions on what uh, a validator does? This, this is our Dart portal. So it has everything in terms of installation. It has everything in terms of how Prism works. It has our API endpoints. So that's the basic information we need to run the node, right? But if someone needs more like for their interest, they want to know what the validator does deep underneath the hood. There is a few more links for that, which I will send out. And uh, that's your first question. So you want to know what validator does. I'm also happy to go into the slide to explain more if you want. Well, but... um, yes, what I'm trying to guess, the, the blocks are created pretty fast in Ethereum. What is, what is the typical day of a validator? Um, okay, yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah, let me just, uh, let me think. Let me just share a few slides. This is really, I, I did explain that a few weeks ago, but this is a really good question that I wish there's more like articles out there, but there isn't many, unfortunately. So, uh, so back to Beacon Chain, right? So you have this essentially the Beacon Chain where my mouth is, right? So now you have your blocks. But you don't have miners right now, okay? So you have, you, remember that you have two rows, you have a proposer and a tester. So let me quickly go through what a proposer and a tester does. And uh, so proposer basically builds the block. So uh, proposer essentially builds the block one by one, okay? And uh, the proposer basically package votes into the block. And this is a, t a testation I just highlighted. So this attestations vote basically votes on what's the canonical chain, what's the right chain. Okay, so this is so this is one row. This is a proposer. It basically builds the block, and this is very similar to Miner. Okay, and and then let's go to a tester. So a, a tester basically submits the attestations, and that is the vote. And then it, it basically, right now it votes two things. It votes LMD ghost, and then it votes for FFG beacon chain. And I can, let me, let me go through that real quick as well. So you have your proposer, you have your tester. Proposer proposes the block that contains some attestations. And then the attestations are submitted by the, by the um, a tester. So um, why would you do a good job if you're a proposal? Why would you care, right? If you're a validator, right? Because you get rewards, you get money, right? So the proposer gets this beacon block proposal reward, right? So the more attestations it includes, the more money it gets, right? And the attester also gets reward. Attester gets reward by voting on the right thing, right? So there's this Casper FFG reward. So they get rewarded by voting on the correct block. So those are the incentive behind voting on the right thing. And uh, I can quickly go through like, so a tester essentially votes, the testers votes are used uh, for four choice in E2, right? Because the problem we're trying to solve is that people can go offline and uh, people could be running different software version. So there could be different chain, different branch, different tree, right? And proof of work solve that by using mining power hardware, right? So you always follow the longest chain. But here in proof of stake, we, we don't have that, right? So we follow validators' votes. So we follow validators' votes, which we follow a tester's votes, right? And this is where the um, this is where the four choice comes in. This is where the attester's votes are being used for. And then I give you an example. This is a pretty good example, right? So so let's say I, let's say I'm a proposer. I'm proposing. I'm, I'm building out this block tree right here, right? And uh, so um, so right now, so right now at the end of my mouth, so this is this is me, I propose this block, right? And uh, so let's say um, I want to build on the block, right? I can decide I want to build on this block or this block two or three, right? But I chose to build on block three because it has more vote. And that's why I chose to build on block three. I also choose to build on block three because I know building on block three will make me more money than building on block two. So this is where the fortress comes in. This is where uh, this is where the game theory comes in, right? Why? So why would incentivize people money and stuff like that? So um, so um, did that answer your question? Um, uh, 
would it be instructive to see uh, this in action, maybe? Uh, to, to see like a, a beacon node running, what it looks like, and maybe what a validating uh, node looks like. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. You have to. This is that should be. A and, and and whilst everyone's here, if you haven't participated, I'm putting the link in the the chat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, go and uh, participate, uh, and 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 you can be a part of this. Now, so I I'm, also love the Discord. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because um, we have wonderful tooling. This is for our uh, Beacon node. So uh, if you do run a Beacon node, so um, you have this monitoring port. By default, it's ATAT. So if you go to localhost 8080, for me it's 8085, just because 8080, I was using it for something else. And then, you, and then you do slash tree, you can, you can get the uh, block tree similar to what I mentioned, right? So if you keep scrolling to the right, and uh, so the green one is the latest canonical one. And then right now the network is perfect. There's no forks, right? So it's just a single line. But when there's forks, you can see there's different branches and stuff like that. It gets a little crazy. But then you can also see like how many like votes like it's it's um voted right right now this block has 966 um, validators voting for it and then it has this much ETH that's behind it as well so this is a very cool tool to to basically uh debug when things goes wrong i have to ask is that in the the manual and the instructions i i didn't realize this is not in the menu, but you have a good point. I will make sure we add that. We'll, we'll, I'll make sure we add it there. If I stake on ETH2 and my internet goes down, what do I lose my stake? Like, what is the current thinking on slashing stakes? Yeah, another good question. So, uh, that's one thing, like, when when we end this session, I want you guys to remember is that um, there's two different vo terminology, vocabulary. There's slashing and there's penalty. Let me explain what each one is. So penalty means that, let me stop sharing, sorry. So penalty means that um, you go offline, like just like you said, your internet goes down, you go offline, or um, you go offline, your internet goes down, or it's some box in the software that you, you cannot attest, right? So this is what we so-called penalty. So penalty, uh, it's not too bad, okay? so. Penalty, what it means that you don't, you, you stop earning the reward that you would have gotten if you were doing things right, right? So I will give you an example. So let's say if you get penalized 33% of the time, you will break even, okay? So so yeah, you if you get penalized 33% of the time, you will break even in the long run, okay? So that's penalty, right? So penalty means that there's something else that's probably not your fault. Internet goes down, your, your electricity goes down. And there's another thing that's called slashing. So slashing is worse. Slashing means that you're intentionally doing something bad. So that means that you're voting on the conflict truth, right? So for example, you're voting on, I send Jeff 100 ETH, but at the same time, you're also voting on, I send Chris 100 ETH, right? So you're voting on this conflict truth. And this is what we so-called slashing. So slashing is bad. Slashing will get you kicked out from the validator pool. And then you will lose some ETH. So the amount of the ETH that you lose is proportional to how many people are getting slashed at the same time. So this is what we so-called the anti-correlation incentive. So we want to discourage people running in the same setup. For example, running all your validators in AWS. It's probably a bad idea. I will not do that. Running all your validators in GCP or like or like basically basically we don't want the chain to go bad at the same time. So we have this anti we have this anti we have this anti correlation incentive. So um, at the minimal when you get slash you lose one ETH. Um, at a certain period, if there's more people get slashed at the same time, essentially times three. So if 33% of the entire validator, which is really extreme right now, if 33% of the 
of the entire validator pool gets slashed within the same time, you will lose your whole balance and then you will get ejected, right? So this is to discourage people that to run your validators in isolated environment. So we want decentralization, right? This is what we want, right? So, um, so, 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 um, so the next question is how, so like, how would you get slash, right? So getting slash, so not getting slash is really easy. Like this is the two things you have to do to not get slash. Do not run your validators simultaneously in different um, setup. For example, don't run your validator, don't, don't run the same validators in GCP but in AWS, because chances are now you have two, not, so now you have two process running in parallel, but they're voting on the same thing, but they may, they may be voting on different things, right? So that's one thing to make sure like, to, to not run the same key in two different setups. Only always run one key in one setup. If you wanna change your setup, make sure your first setup is shut off, it's not running anymore, then change it to a second setup. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, don't run untrusted software, right? It's like when we release version it, for my team, we always sign the thing. So we have, so, so don't run a software that's from an untrusted source, just like they may mess with you. They may put some buggy code in there that will cause you to get slashed. So if you follow these two rules, which I think is pretty easy to follow, that you will guarantee you to not get slashed. But what if you did want to run that same validator key on, so so let's say AWS does fall down. It would be nice if you had it running on Google uh, Cloud Platform. Right. So, so, yeah, we also do that. We have this federated cluster, right? But you have to make sure that uh, you have to make sure that AWS or Google go down first before you start on the before you have to go down first, and then you start on the other process, right? You don't want to have two processes running in parallel for 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 just no reason. It's, it's basically one or another. And we have another question from uh, Guy. Or do uh, you want me to say it's in the chat? I could. Uh, yeah, it's in the chat. I just okay. was wondering, uh, uh, basically, even if my computer at night uh, um, updates and restarts, I lose my connection and that would be enough to get a penalty, right? Okay. So you will miss one or two both, right? So you miss, which is not that bad if you ask me, right? It's like, I mean, it's hard to be 100% profitable, right? But if you can be like 95% profitable, that's okay too, right? You probably lost a few cents. You probably lost a, you probably lost a quarter because your computer goes dumb, but that's okay, right? It's, oh, okay, okay. It's, it's not too bad, right? Yeah. So it, it sounds like, again, Eric had a question about the, the penalty is proportional to length of time you're, you were down. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it, it is not like proportional. It just like think about like just every vote you miss. So every six minutes you miss, uh, you probably lost like twenty cents given the current ETH price. And uh, I mean, it's not like the end of the world. But if you want to be perfect, you can, right? You can say like, if my validator goes down, I'm gonna switch to GCP or some other cloud provider service. And it's totally up to you. But we try to make this protocol very user friendly. So even if it goes down, we understand that and you don't lose that much money. Got uh, another question from Andy. Uh, uh, Andy, you want to say it or would you like me? Uh, so Andy, and this is a great question because I remember in the first iteration of the, the in November of, of 2019, I asked uh, this question of the, of the, the team on Discord. So if you want to voluntarily stop validating and get your 32 E's back, um, how is that? And I remember the first iteration, uh, it was like, no, it's, it's just test net. But how does one get your 32 E's back? So this is, this is the same thing as the transfer thing. This is very similar. And this is probably takes slightly longer than that. For this, you will have to wait until phase 1.5. And uh, this is without, trans without the functionality, um, so there's two ways to do it, right? You can either, like I said earlier, you can either sell your validator share to someone else, or you can transfer it back to it one. And so there's two options to that. Or you could transfer, you can, the third option is that you can withdraw into 
phase 1.5, and that's the worst case. And they can be done, but you need you need to have some sort of shard in place. You need to have sort of the EVM within a shard. You have some sort of that setup, and that won't be there for um, they they won't be there for the probably at least a year. And we do understand the risk, right? We do understand the risk. That's probably like the biggest risk. That's why starting out like not that many people may participate because of that. And that's why you get a higher return. So th this is getting to a question I had, which I hadn't thought about, but um, you know, hod hodlers versus traders, right? And, and uh, my question was like, has there been any studies on how many, I mean, how many people are expected, how much ETH is expected to flow into Ethereum 2? Because yeah. in my mind, when this question was asked somewhere, wherever, I didn't even think about it. I thought, well, of course you'd want to do this. But I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, you can email me at Jeff at Hodlit, you know. So, and, and it's going to be a hard sell, I think, for a lot of people, uh, not crazy like myself, that you have to wait maybe two years to transfer it out. <laughs> yeah, so there is a report right there. I'm not sure how many of you guys have read it. Sorry, you have to sign up. I'm trying to see if I can find this PDF, like, I did really once I have it downloaded, but it's just annoying that I make you sign up for this shit. Is it the Codify report you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Codify. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, so yeah. So for the Codify report, uh, I don't, I haven't done much study myself. Like, I don't really have a good, like, intuition. But for now, like, the people I talk to, the hobbies, they seem very optimistic. They're really excited. I don't, I don't think we have problem getting to the minimum deposit threshold, which is to start Bitcoin chain. That's about 16,000 ETH. That's about 500, about, about, yeah, about 500K ETH to be staked. I don't think we'll have the problem just like, yeah. So I have a question that's a bit related to that. Sorry, I, I'm just jumping in because I actually sure. don't think that's possible for me to raise my hand. I was sure. down for it. Since I'm the host, I can't raise my hand, I think. Anyway, the, I guess, so just, so if I understand until uh, ETH 1.5, is that what you're calling it? Until then, if you, if you start staking, then it's going to be a little bit harder to get to stop staking. Is that right? It's going to be kind of somewhat locked. Is that, is it, is that, I'm just trying to repeat what I just said. locked, not for that long. It's going to be locked for a few, first few months until someone, um, until there is a solution that's accepted by the community and implemented. The okay. hardest, the, so the hardest part here is not about implementing, right? The hardest part is that to find a solution that so that people are happy, right? This is decentralized governance at the finest, right? It's like, it's hard to like find a solution that like everyone's happy with. So the, and then the, and then the, and then the, it's change will use it, right? So that's something that will take time. But I personally, I think we'll get there before like one year, probably like six months. Cause people want to cash out, right? It's like, we cannot just lock people's money like that, even though that returns. Okay, so so here's here's the the core of my question. It seems like uh, you know there is some level of uh, of staking which which is required for security. I mean, you know, some number of participants, which is going to translate into some amount of ether staked right. that is going to be required for the security, the desired security. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the um, I, I, I recall that there is kind of a negative feedback mechanism discussed, which would kind of incentivize more people to come in if there was not, I mean, if, if you had a scenario possibly beyond this initial stable, this initial point where, you know, have people be becoming stakers, people leaving being stakers, and you want to incentivize at least the minimum level, then Right. You could raise the the effectively the the, the block reward. It's probably not quite re raise the reward if there's not enough people participating, enough staked. 
is I just wanted to, I, I think it's kind of an obvious thing. And my understanding is that there is something just like that discussed. I just wanted to understand what, if you had any updates on this. Right. So, um, so the, so the amount of validators has a, has a, has a direct proportion relationship to your reward, right? So the more validators, um, you, 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 you will slowly, um, get less reward because we kind of want this healthy network to be around like, um, maybe 300,000 validators. That's a lot of ETH. Yeah. But you probably get a like 5% reward during that time. So there's this E2 calculator, which I just posted basically kind of calculate the curve for you. And I just want to say the curve is not finalized. Like the, 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 econ the economic parameter is not finalized. It's very, it's easy to change from the implementation side. We can always change that, but this is something that like, if people have a concern, you, we have to speak up and then we can make, make the modification. Just right now, we're probably looking at, um, if there's one mil, if there's one mil each state, you get 17%, which is a lot, even like, even at the end of Topaz, we were still at one mil and people were earning like 20% and that is like crazy, you know, but like, but yeah, so essentially there is a trade-off right now and the, the trade-off could be adapted based on the parameter and that's up to the community to decide. We, I, I realize it's time. If it's okay, can we extend it a little bit? And yeah, we can extend it to maybe like, yeah, send it to, yeah, we can extend it. I don't mind. Because I, I feel like it started to get juicy. Uh, <laughs> juicy. Uh, Andy has a, a question. Um, how do you ensure a, a single validator key goes to a single person? Um, trying to understand this question. Let me think. Uh, maybe I could help uh, okay. because this was a question I had. And this was a question that I, I came to the Discord quite recently. Uh, when I started up my validators, I was doing something quite dumb. I was spinning up virtual machine after virtual machine after virtual machine to independently have extra validators because I had more than 32 ETH. I wanted to have all of them working for me. And somebody on the, on the Discord very nicely said, you, don't, you shouldn't do that. Just type in this and you could have as many validators and just one beacon node operating mm -hmm. and have multiple validators each with 32 ETH in it working for you. Is right. that, is that uh, help Andy with uh, the question or? So it's a, not a one-to-one -one mapping. I currently am running 12 uh, validators on a really crappy uh, Mac mini, for example. <laughs> right, so you don't nest, we don't, we don't, I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't really see the benefit of ensuring one validator key to a single person. For example, like I want to have the flexibility to launch a thousand validators, which is what I'm doing for testing right now, just to myself. And uh, okay, so just so wanted to ensure that. Okay, so let me rephrase the question. So Andy wants to ensure that um, three hundred thousand validators is in five wells and five hubs. So. So Andy wants to make sure that we're decentralized, right? We're not very centralized within the within the ecosystem. And uh, well, that's something that's kind of like beyond my study. And uh, I do think about this a lot as a hobbyist. Last time I read a Twitter thread, like the top three exchanges, the top Binance, Coinbase, and some someone else, only only hold like 3% of the ETH stake. And that made me really happy to hear that, right? It's not that many players has like that many ETH basically. This is not like Tesos or any other blockchains out there. Like luckily like Ethereum uses proof of work to basically bootstrap its currency or the or bootstrap its distribution. So I would say it's very dis dis distributed at this point. So it's very hard. It's very hard to do that, right? And, uh, but you can also make this argument, like what happens if just like Coinbase decides to jump in and then throw all their money to become validators. And now, and now, um, and now the E2 proof of station, 80% is Coinbase, right? So what do we do at this point, right? So we can analyze this from, um, from two point of view, right? If Coinbase is doing a good job, 
why not, right? This is an open decentralized protocol. Like if they're doing good, it's okay. Yeah, whatever, right? Just let them do their job. They're making their money. People are happy, right? So what happens if they start doing something bad, right? They start stealing Jeff's money, they start stealing my money just because they have so much power, right? And so at this point, we have thought about this, this type of scenario. So there is, is this, um, there is, is always this um, minority, how far you can do as validators. So me and Jeff or the community basically just can give Coinbase the middle finger and be like, peace out, right? I'm gonna just start my own chain. And eventually we'll just like start leaking out the Coinbase balance. And then we have our own chain, right? And the good side with that is that we make a lot more money because we essentially just burn the whole Coinbase stake as well. So what's nice about this is there's always this decentralized governance behind it, that like community, we trust the community, we trust people and we can always like do the right thing ourselves. I, we got another question, and this is one that uh, I believe, um, so it, the, for the best reward, you're better off running a single validator with your full stake, so your nodes are fewer, but make sure it's super reliable. reliable. Is, is that, I don't believe that's true. I believe after 32 ETH, you're not given, you don't earn, right now it's what, uh, based on this 14.2%, I thought the 14.2% is only applied to the 32 ETH and then if anything above that does not earn or does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. So the max effective balance is 32 ETH. So if you have 32 ETH, cool. But you will not deposit 30, sorry, you will not deposit 64 ETH to run that one validator. So you could have this 32, you have, you have this 32 extra buffer or you think you could get double, no, you can't, right? So if with 64, you just run two validators versus running one validator. So you, so all your 64 ETH are in play, right? If you have 96 ETH, you will run three validators versus running any other numbers, basically. And uh, from the hardware point of view, it's phase zero is very lightweight. I'm running like 4,000 validators on my MacBook Pro, no problem. 1.9 gigabyte of RAM. CPUs is probably like 20% most of the time. I think Preston runs about like 4,000 validators on his Raspberry Pi 4, and that's insane. That's like, that's like so much eat on validator on a Raspberry Pi, like you should never do that, but it works, it works, right? So it's very lightweight uh, uh, today, yeah. I can attest, I can attest. It's, <laughs> so yeah, and uh, so yeah, so you should run these in different environments uh, to avoid penalties. Uh, I agree. I totally agree that right. If you have, and you um, not different environment. You should run the same environment within yourself. So if you have ten validators, you should run ten validators together. But what you should not do is you should not run your ten validators with other validators. That's in GCP, AWS, the. Uh, D, uh, digital ocean, for example, right? You should run this as isolated as possible. Uh, maybe at your home with a, with your Comcast network. If your network goes down, you may have an LTE card as, as a backup. You may have an electric backup generator if your power goes down. Just as safe and as decentralized as possible. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I think, do we have time for any more questions or? I had just one question, now I'm done. Okay. And the question is around the keys. Mm -hmm. So for when I spun up my validators recently, I thought I was being extra smart and fancy. And I had different uh, passwords, if you will, for my validating keys. And then of course I realized, oh, well, I need to have them all with the same password to unlock on my uh, uh, computer. So, and that's when I started learning that there were multiple keys. So there's a key store, and then there's the, the, the passcode basically to unlock it. Yeah. Um, which is somewhat, it kind of reminded me of kind of like EOS a bit with uh, different keys for different levels of ownership and control. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of keys, like um, I have to admit like the whole key management infrastructure right now is kind of a mess from Pris Prismatic Lab Prison, Lighthouse, all the clients out there. We're still working on formalizing the key management so um, long story short, there's two different types of keys. There's hot keys and there's withdraw keys. 
So when you deposit the to ETH to become a validator, you have to specify those two keys, okay? So let me explain what those keys are. So you have a hot keys. Your hot keys are your signing keys. So when you propose a block, when you submit your vote for a block, you use the hot key to sign, right? So these hot keys are used very frequently. Like they're like they are they are basically within your laptop. They're they're so they are what your Bitcoin node and validator client uses, right? The second key is the with, withdraw key. And those keys are absolutely crucial. Those keys, like remember, when you generate this withdraw key, you generate offline and then you don't put it on, you don't put that within your laptop. It should be your cold storage, it's kind of like your hardware wallet, you write that thing down, air gap, mat, uh, like just like the air gap uh, manner, basically. And uh, so, so the withdraw key are the key that um, where your withdraw goes to. So, so here's a nice thing. So if your um, validator ever gets hacked, if you have a hacker that gets a hold of your validator, which I don't think will happen, it, it can cause you to get slashed, right? But the thing is the, well, that could never, but, they, but the hacker could never steal your balance because they don't have your, they don't have your withdraw key. Your withdraw key are essentially within your cold storage. So it's kind of nice to have this separation. You have your withdraw key, whether your money goes to once you withdraw or get slashed, and then your signing key, whether that's how you perform your job. So there's hot key and there's withdraw key. But to learn more, I more than happy to like point you guys to some like uh, blogs that um, the Ethereum Foundation have been writing that explains the um, keys. I find them pretty useful. Oh, I, ha I have a question. So how many lines are in a typical Ethereum client? Like you have to take I'm sorry? Like code wise? Like, sorry, how, how many lines of code? How many lines are in a typical, uh, are in, let's say your, your uh, implementation for uh, that you're, you're writing for Ethereum 2.0. Uh, how many lines of code? Thinking, uh, I would say probably like, um, I would say probably, 3,000 lines of implementation and then probably like 9,000 9, lines of unit tests. Um, wow. We, thought, <laughs> like, we recently did like an update with quant stamp and then like we, and then like, um, we always did pretty good on unit tests, but we all, uh, we have like probably like 75% of coverage, but one yeah. of our feedback is to like, we need higher coverage. That's what we've been working on, just trying to get the unit test coverage up. And, it's it's hard, but we need to get there. Like, just eventually, this is money. We don't want people lose money because of our software spend. That's that, that that's just horrible, you know. Does that horrible. include the uh, EVM uh, mod oh. itself? And yeah, uh, that's a good question. Want to clarify? So there's no EVM. Um, this is speaking chain. So this is just a proof of stake consensus chain for staking. There's no concept of execution there so there's no user it just validators uh it just validators um voting on consensus it just it's a consensus chain think about it you think of get parity uh owning the proof of work module basically okay so it'd be comparable to say just the proof of stake uh, yes. in Cardano or Algorand or whatever. It is a proof of stake chain, literally, yeah, yeah. You know, with 3,000 versus 9,000, it, it, it's almost like an order of magnitude, and that's almost about the amount of work for specification and then formal analysis. Have oh, you yeah, that's for, for sure. thought yeah. about formal, uh, performing formal methods on this? Uh, there's definitely formal verification that's been done on the spec on, on, on the E2 spec, spec itself, which is written in pseudocode and Python. Mm -hmm. There's there's two rounds of formal verification done already. If you're just interested, you just can do all that as well. But uh but we're mostly going through the code audit, which is like just just like go code audit, plain good go code audit and stuff. Hmm. Well, it is getting late so i want to make sure everyone's okay with time and if uh, also if you guys have any questions like telegram me dm me on twitter I'm happy to answer them like yeah sure. well i'd like to if there's no other questions so please uh 
if there are no other questions, I'd love to then, yes, thank Terrence once again for, for coming in and, and helping uh, uh, clear up Ethereum 2. I, I know we'll, we'll still have four questions. I, maybe we, we can uh, uh, harangue you back around uh, to uh, maybe even to showcase how to uh, spin up uh, uh, these nodes. And again, I, I think Ethereum 2 is going to be a, a, a huge leap forward. I mean, it's been how many years in the making? I mean, uh, so it, it shows just how much work is needed and how much work is still needed. Um, and it's going to be a, a huge undertaking. It has become a huge undertaking. It's going to be a huge undertaking. Yeah, so it's, it's really great. It. Super happy to be here. I'm really glad that we have this awesome community just like right by home for me. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys. And uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. We're happy to do this again in another month or two as, as we get closer to mainnet. And uh, yeah, just let me know. I'm always here. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And uh, thank you all for coming and uh, sharing your evenings uh, or mornings or afternoons. All right. Thanks, guys. Talk to you guys later.